Welcome back everyone. This is week 14, at least I believe it's week 14. Who knows anymore? Well, this week we are going to be looking at the Islamic empires of medieval Europe. And this will be an interesting uh, week for us because it'll give us a lot of context. We have been almost exclusively looking at what we would consider Western cultures in our last unit. And so in this unit, you can tell how we have branched out. We looked at Byzantine culture, which is a really interesting mix. Uh, it is sits right between what we would consider Western Asia and Europe. And in this week, we are going to stay in that Western Asian uh, region. And then we're going to make our way back to Europe. Now, I am showing you this map and no, it is not upside down, right? Because when I show everybody this map in my live person classes, I have them, I ask them, um, what do you think about this map? And the first reaction I get is it's upside down. But if you stop and read it, it's not really upside down because all of the font is right side up. What you're looking at is a map that is oriented in a different direction than what you're used to. Right? When maps, the maps that we use today in our world are very Eurocentric, meaning Europe is in the literal center and it's at the top. And so what we're seeing here is the world flipped upside down. Keep in mind that throughout history, people have drawn maps and their maps weren't always oriented the way that we orient them today. And you're going to see in a film today uh, how people living in the Islamic empire saw the world in this view. The other thing I want to mention is in terms of when we talk about the Middle Ages, when we talk about the Middle Ages as being this period of darkness and nothing really happened, that is untrue. And we'll look at that next week in the next two weeks. But it also is not necessarily true around the world. So China was flourishing during this time, but also closer to home, the Islamic empires of Western Asia, North Africa, and into Spain, this was their golden age of learning advancements. If you're wondering how all of those ideas and things that we learned from Greece and Rome, how all of those made their way back to Europe in the Renaissance, they made their way back to Europe for the Renaissance through these Islamic empires. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about religion. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Christianity and why it appealed to people and how medieval Christianity is very different than the Christianity that some of you might practice. But let's take a look at some of the similarities between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These are all monotheistic religions, meaning they believe in one God. They have similar stories and ho in their holy texts. Uh, we usually call these the Abrahamic religions because they all have a similar origin story. So they all believe in prophets. Where we're going to get a little um, uh, deviation is in that, for example, in Islam, that comes after Christianity, Muslims do believe in Christ, but they don't believe that he was the son of God, and they don't believe that he was the last prophet. For them, the last prophet is Muhammad. We're going to see the struggle between good and evil is a major theme in all of these religions. They all originate in Southwest Asia, so what we would consider today the Middle East. And both Christianity and Islam are founded on the Jewish faith. And I did promise you we are going to, at some point, touch on Judaism as well, probably when we talk about Christianity and kind of Western Europe. Right. So in this map, we have the spread of Islam. And Islam spread like wildfire. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one, which we're going to look at a little bit more in depth right now, it just appealed to a lot of people. Secondly, Islam was very much a religion that 
was militarized in terms of going out there and taking control of land. So in this way, they're going to be very similar to the Christian medieval church. All right. So we're going to have a lot of similarities here. And again, when I'm talking about Islam, when I'm talking about Christianity, Judaism, I'm talking about them in the Middle Ages. They're very different religions and uh, different organizations today. But back in the day, these were all generally uh, in the Middle Ages, both Islam and Christianity are going to become militarized. And so you can see that they push all the way into, remember what we called the Persian Empire. And then they're going to always be struggling against the Byzantine Empire here, down into Egypt, all of North Africa. And this is part of why North Africa has a different culture, right? That there had already been different groups of people and cultures developing in this region of Africa, but this brought in the religion of Islam to North Africa and then up in through Spain. Right. So why was Islam so attractive to people? Well, consider that Orthodox Christianity, which is what we looked at in the Byzantine Empire, they were Orthodox Christians, it seemed very foreign and unrelated to the lives of Arabs. So the people that first adopt Christianity are going to be the people living in the Arabian Peninsula. And these were originally nomadic tribal groups for the most part. The Byzantine and Persian empires were considered oppressive and cruel by these nomadic people. Islam provided an alternative to old Arab class structures. So I mentioned they were kind of these nomadic tribal groups. And so Islam provided a bit more social mobility within those groups. And in it, it eliminated inter-clan fighting because you were not supposed to fight with people of your religion. All right. uh, one more thing I am going to mention here is uh, for, a, as we're going to see in Christianity, for a lot of lower class, poor people, slaves, those sorts of people, along with women who we know now in during these times kind of were at that same social status level. Islam also provided new opportunities and new freedoms. Now, uh, one of the dynasties that we are going to look at when it comes to the Islamic empires, and I call them the Islamic empires because there are several of them, several iterations, and at one point they break up and you have different uh, empires at work. So I just kind of generally refer to them as the Islamic empires. So you have the Umayyad dynasty and the Umayyad dynasty is really strong from about 661 to 750. And it expands into North Africa, Spain and Central Asia. So it's that large uh, expansion outward. We're going to see during this dynasty, the political center of Islam shift from Medina up to Syria. And the establishment of the Umayyad capital in Damascus. And this is the great mosque in Damascus. And I'm going to have you watch a film on this mosque. It is one of these first prototype mosques. And so we're going to learn about what is a mosque, what is it shaped like, right? And, and what are some symbolisms in the shape and the different objects within a mosque. Now, I will say it's this mosque in particular is very fascinating because it is placed on top of a church, which used to be a pagan temple, which before the Romans was a native temple to the people that were living there before the Romans. So this had been a site where several different religious buildings were were built. And this is going to be a theme that we're going to find whenever there is a conquest, whether it is a spiritual conquest or a political conquest, we're going to see that 
there's going to be the decision made to build your house of worship over the house of worship of those whom you conquered. And this is something that was practiced all the way when Europeans made their way over to the Americas. And we see this throughout Latin America and into North America. All right. So after you see the film and you have an idea of what these very early mosques look like, then we have what do they look like once they leave Western Asia? And they're going to adapt. So the mosque is really based off of Muhammad's home, like a very simple desert home. And so there are certain things that all of these mosques have. However, the regional elements of design and architecture are going to meld with Islamic belief systems to create different shapes and forms. So in Iran and Central Asia, you have the biaxial Iwan type. So you have this one. And notice that they all have their courtyards. In Anatolia, which is where the Hagia Sophia is located, you have the use of one massive central dome. So they take inspiration from the Hagia Sophia. In the Indian subcontinent, you get this triple dome structure. And so this is the India of the Mughals. In China, because Islam does reach East Asia, it, you have the regional architecture of these detached structures, again, with the courtyard. The one we're going to be looking at in a minute is Spain, and Spain and North Africa share an architectural history. Um, if you travel from Spain into North Africa, say Morocco, a lot of the buildings look the same because they come from this tradition. So Hypostyle Hall is just a very basic rectangular building with a large courtyard in France. And South and Southeast Asia, you have this almost pyramid-shaped construction, which reflects a bit of the regional architecture and the influence of the Buddhist pagoda. So we are going to talk a little bit about Spain, and I'm going to try to keep it brief. This is where I spent a lot of years researching for uh, my graduate work, so I will try to keep my excitement to a minimum here. So we can see here how Spain, after the fall of Rome, was conquered by these barbarians, So the vi and it becomes a Visigoth kingdom. Now, during the, these Visigoths are going to adopt Christianity. So now they become Christian, a Christian kingdom. And then we're going to have the invasion by these Islamic armies and the conquest of most of Spain, right up until the tippy top. The top and parts of this region right here don't quite get adopted into the Islamic empire. And so we, you start seeing a resistance there. And this is these are the people that are then going to mount the reconquest. They call it the reconquest of Spain. All right. So this Islamic kingdom in Spain is going to go by the name Al-Andalus. And it, it took up all of Spain. And I always forget to mention Portugal. But yes, Portugal is there. And so it's a conquest of the entire Iberian Peninsula. It was governed by an emir under the Umayyad Caliphate, and then the Abbasids. And eventually it breaks off and it becomes its own caliphate along with North Africa, parts of North Africa, Morocco region. And the capital of this new region was the city of Cordoba. So here we see, we can see the extent of Al-Andalus. And these different tones show you how the reconquest went from north to south. This is why if you were in Spain, north, northern Spain has a very different architectural style and culture than southern Spain, which had a longer uh, Islamic influence. So what was the economy of Al-Andalus like? It was a very prosperous economy. Cordoba had some of the best universities in the entire European continent, and people would travel from Christian 
countries, Christian kingdoms, to come and study and learn at, at, at in Al Andalus in the city of Cordoba. It, it was an agricultural society, as most of these were going to be. They raised cereals and grapes and olives. Muslims introduced new irrigation techniques to the area. Spain is very similar to California. It's very, very dry and it doesn't rain a lot. So you need those irrigation techniques in order to build up your population. There was active trade with the other parts of the world. And these are two of their coins, the dinar and the dirham. And they were actually valued so much that they were used throughout Western Christian Europe. And I always find it fascinating that you have these Christian people in the uh, in their own kingdoms using these Islamic coins with parts of the Quran written on them. But they were very valuable. Now, what was society like? And I brought in some images from paintings which show us that there wasn't a clear-cut divide between the Islamic Empire and the Christian kingdoms of the North. People interacted and they traded, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. So you have the Arabs, and they are going to be kind of at the top of the social ladder. They're going to be the most important and the wealthiest. Then you have the Berbers. The Berbers are, there's more of them, and they are still alive and thriving in North Africa, uh, but they are going to be kind of of a lower status. They are the people uh, that are going to inhabit most of Northern Africa. You have the Muladis who are Catholics who convert to Islam. And now you're saying like, wait, how, why did they convert to Islam? Well, you have to think that there were people that had incredibly strong faith back then just like they do today. But you, there were also people that were quite pragmatic. And so they realized that by converting to Islam, they could hold government posts. They might be able to grow their business more. And so they would convert to Islam. Then you have Mossarabs who were Christians living in Al-Andalus. You were allowed to be a Christian and live in Al-Andalus. And then you have the Jews who also coexisted in Al-Andalus. And for me, I was so drawn to this one particular period of time in Spain because you have all of these groups and they're living together in sometimes in peace and harmony and sometimes they're at each other's throats. And the art that is produced out of that interaction to me is absolutely unique and beautiful. So we have this concept that comes out in the 70s of convivencia. So for a very long time, everybody thought that you know, these three religions could not live with each other and they all just ended up killing each other. Then in the 70s, a historian came out with the idea that these people were actually interacting and living together in this coexistence of Muslims, Jews, and Christians. Now, it was a controversial concept. And the reason because for this the, is that before that, people, you know, just thought everybody was killing each other. But also, this was going swinging a little bit to kumbaya, all right, because it's never that clear cut. There were, there was a lot of tension. There were periods of extreme violence, but there were also periods of great cultural exchange. And so I don't think it was either a period that was horrible and everybody was killing each other and or a period where everybody kind of loved each other and were living happily together. It's kind of more in the middle. And I think this period of convivencia is best exemplified in architecture. So I'm going to show you a few examples. A few more paintings to show you. We have this piece. And I love showing this piece because this is what we call Mudéjar architecture. So Mudéjar architecture comes from the melding of Christian and Muslim techniques and styles. So what we have is a what looks like an like a Muslim 
palace, but it's really a Christian palace. And if you look very closely, yes, there is all sorts of almost calligraphic and floral motifs and the horseshoe arch and all of this. But up here, you have Western European Christian imagery. So cities in Al-Andalus, uh, the cities were always surrounded by walls, the streets were narrow, and the layout of the towns was irregular. Every city had its fortified palace, so it's Alcázar, a mosque, and a market. They had sewer systems, and they also had uh, advanced services like libraries and hospitals. So these were very advanced cities. So you're talking at or above the level of what the ancient Romans were living at. In terms of architecture, we're going to see abundant decoration, a lot of play between lights and shadows, a love of water. You're going to see a lot of gardens and water motifs because these are people that originally come from the desert. And so remember how we looked at the Persian Empire and that word paradisia, the paradise and the the matching of the garden with paradise, we're going to see this imagery as well in these Islamic empires. So lots of columns and arches, and sometimes when they're building, they just take the column right off a Roman building and put it into their own structures. And then the roofs are often going to be wooden and flat, and in some cases, not so much in Spain, but in other parts of the empire, you're going to see the use of domes. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. This is Medina al-Sahara, and this is found right outside of Seville. This is a recent found find where they just found this entire palace structure, and they're still excavating and kind of uh, renovating it. Here we have a Christian castle. So this is a little bit after the reconquest, but you can see how on the outside it looks like a traditional Western medieval castle, and then you go inside and you have a very traditional Islamic style roof and these arches that are very Islamic inspired. Alrighty. This is the Giralda in Spain. So this is where a mosque was originally located and they destroyed it after the reconquest and built a gigantic cathedral. But the courtyard remains. And the bell tower, the, which was originally the tower from which um, they would have called out for prayer, was preserved and they just built the bell tower part on the very top. Baths were also a huge component of Islamic cities. So very similar to that Roman tradition of the baths. So baths are also going to be important. And I think the last video I'm going to have you watch is on the Mosque of Cordoba. So this is a bird's eye view of the mosque itself. And this is the interior of the mosque. Now, most of the mosque looks like this. And what's so impressive about this mosque is it's a hypostyle hall and it actually started off quite small. But as the capital kept growing and growing, they just kept adding to it. And so it's a sea of columns and it's just the most impressive thing I think I've ever been, I've ever walked through in terms of architecture. And I've been to some really impressive places. It just in the feel and the mood that it creates. Now, unfortunately, this beautiful mosque uh, was uh, not destroyed, which is a good thing, uh, when Charles V of Spain sees this mosque he conquers, right? He He's going to inherit the kingdom from his parents. He's going to order a cathedral built here, but he's like, eh, don't destroy the mosque because it's really beautiful. And we're going to see that over and over where the Christian kings are going to come in and they're like, don't destroy it because it's really pretty, uh, but make it Christian. And so they actually build this massive Christian cathedral. It's, it's a Renaissance cathedral within 
the mosque itself. And you're going to get a chance to see that in the video. And it's a beautiful cathedral itself. You can see it right here. But it just makes absolutely no sense within the mosque. And it's, it's kind of a tragic destruction of this original mosque. And this is in the mosque itself. Some other photos for you. And so the reconquest of Spain is kind of, it ends in the city of Granada right here. And it ends in the very important year of 1492. You can all think of what else happened in 1492. Well, all of that was going on while Spain was also finishing their reconquest of Spain. Now, I, I'm always dubious of the term reconquest because I don't think they were ever, you know, held it for that long. But this is what the, the name of this particular takeover is called. And when they reconquer Granada, the king and queen of Spain, uh, Ferdinand and Isabel, are going to move into the Alhambra of Granada. And I'm just going to leave you with these images because they are some of the most beautiful manifestations of Islamic art and architecture. So you see the motifs of the gardens, the pools of water. This is a fortress up on the hillside. And it is absolutely beautiful in its harmony, in its use of proportions. So they were very much thinking about mathematics and proportions. And originally there would have been a riot of color in these areas, which unfortunately is not there anymore. But the use of those water structures, it is an absolutely magical place. And even today, you can see the remains of the Islamic influence in these regions. These are photos of uh, the hills right behind the Alhambra, which were the Muslim quarters after the reconquest and also later became Jewish quarters of the city before Spain went crazy and got rid of everybody, right? And then on the right, you have some of these very narrow alleyways where they still keep up the tradition of kind of selling out in the streets and some of those same uh, artistic traditions. So that's where I am going to end. I told you I would try to keep it brief and I'm going to have you watch a couple documentaries that really bring these spaces to life. And I will see all of you next week.